I told you last week that we, we have as guests this week, Glenn and uh, Christine Hughes from Australia. And um, are we, okay, yeah, there we go. There we go, we've got it. Um, and they're here. They arrived uh, Friday, Friday about noon, yeah. And they've been getting their motorhome cleaned up and ready to return. They've just completed six months of touring the U.S. in a motorhome. And, and uh, was it two years ago? Three. Three years ago, they did another six months. And, and I, I thought they had been here, uh, done three uh, motorhome tours, that this was the third, but it was the second one. They've been here in the U.S. Uh, four different times. But they probably have seen more of this country than any of the rest of us sitting in this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, Glenn is a high school teacher in Sydney, Australia, and uh, his, his perspectives I thought would be very interesting because one of the main reasons they came here was to see the solar eclipse from Idaho, right? Wyoming. Wyoming. Okay, so I don't get it all right. <laughs> it's close, guys. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I, I introduced Glenn Hughes to uh, give us a, a mini message here about uh, the visibility of the invisible God. Okay, I'm turned on and I'm audible. Well, thanks for that introduction, Tony. I will. Uh, I hope you can understand my Australian accent. Although if I block my nose, I'll sound worse, like a Queenslander. But um, and I have got a bit of a cold. I can sympathise if colds are going around. Well, I've caught one of them, like a lot of Californians. So yes, it caught up with me a few days ago. But I'm on the mend. So yes, I've been teaching science almost 40 years. I started on the 31st of January, 1978. So that's been a long career, but I love it. It's what I'm wired to do. That's why I'm still doing it, and I'll be back at work on the 29th of January for the 41st year of science teaching. I don't know whether I'll be seeing the year out there, because I'm 63 in March, so um, we'll see what happens. Anyway, that's my lovely wife, Christine, over there. Yes, we're still married, I have to say this, after two six-month sessions living in an RV. It's pretty cosy, but God's put us together, and we're, we're, um, we have a few little dips occasionally, but it all, it's all going well. But we fly home tomorrow evening at about 11 o'clock from LA when the big storm's supposed to be rolling in. So let's hope we can take off safely. Well, Tony's kindly done this slide for me, the visibility of the invisible God. And um, I've just got the... Okay. Um, you may be aware of where this the word, the visibility and the invisible connection comes from. If I'll start off with Romans chapter 1, verse 19. What may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So there's the word invisible in the NASB translation. Yes, our God is invisible, but there's enough visible things in the world to see that we can be sure that there is a God. So August 21st last uh, was the Great American Eclipse, which was visible from Idaho across to South Carolina. 14 states got totality, and uh, you had to be, there's the track for the 21st of August 2017, I think that's Idaho there, isn't it? There's Oregon, Idaho, we were there in Wyoming about where the dot is, and it went all the way across. And a little lucky town there called Carbondale, I think that's in southern Illinois, gets it again. Your next eclipse is April the 8th, 2024. So you've got something to look forward to. That's seven years, no, six years of planning. Get organised now and get yourself there to see it. From Texas to Maine it goes. It's an awesome sight. So it was called the Great American Eclipse because it began in the Pacific Ocean, only crossed the 14 states and ended in the Atlantic Ocean across no other countries, islands or anything. So hence the name the Great American Eclipse. And to educated people in the 21st century, it was a majestic natural phenomenon, wasn't it? Fantastic. I hope, actually, just to show if did anybody see the total phase? All right, some people are saying, I know Tony saw a partial. Okay, but here's how it happened. There's Australia. Now, that's about where the Earth would have been. Oh, wrong way. That's about where Australia would have been, because there's the moon, there's the shadow of the moon shining on off the coast of Oregon. There's the sun way off there. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, 
but it's 400 times further away. So when the moon happens to pass in front of the sun, which it does somewhere on Earth every six months or so, if you're in the right place, you'll get it, it'll totally block the sun and it'll be totally eclipsed. So it's this wonderful cosmic coincidence, isn't it? The moon is a lot smaller than the sun by 400 times, but the sun's a lot further away, and when the moon passes exactly in front of the sun, you will get a total eclipse. Now, this is just a partial eclipse. Partials are interesting, but they don't, you, really, you, you wouldn't even know it was happening. It wouldn't, it's only like that's about half covered there. It's got to get to 75 or so percent, and then you start thinking, oh, the light's a bit weird, the sky's got a bit funny, what's happening? But you've really got to get to total eclipse. When you get this fantastic look, there's the moon, the corona of the sun is that area around there. Now, depending, this is called the diamond ring effect because the last deep valley on the moon's edge, the last bit of sunlight shining through it, and it sparkles to the camera, called the diamond ring effect. People, I've seen enough eclipses over the years, and well, I've actually seen six eclipses in 40 years, but people have been decided to get married during totality. I have a, a video, the 1991 eclipse in Hawaii, they got, they timed it so that the vows were made during the, they had a six minute and a half minute totality. They had plenty of time for the service. Uh, we only got two minutes and 20 seconds, but the next one you're seeing in 2024 is more than four minutes. So that's worth seeing. Um, all right, now, however, here's, Here's your eclipse track in 2024. Now, in, those, in that decade, in 20 years from 21 to 2040, America's only getting two eclipses. Blue lines means they're total. If you're under that blue line, you'll get total. The red line means an annual eclipse. The moon's a bit smaller than the sun, and when the moon passes in front of the sun, you get this big ring of sunlight, but it's not as spectacular as total. But look at Australia. We're covered in blue lines. It's going to be a fantastic dec well, double decade, um, especially in the... 2028, I can step out my back door, July 22nd, 2028, something I've dreamed about as a kid, and see a total eclipse in Sydney. It's going to be fabulous. And there's one in 2030 and 2037 and 2038. So it's an exciting time for down under. But to put it into perspective, you might, for a given town or location on the earth, it's somewhere between 360 and 400 years on average that you'll get totality. So that's why you've usually got to travel somewhere to see the eclipses. And they can occur down in the polar regions. People will be taking flights from South America to go and view this one. You'll be paying $900 a seat. Um, same up here, you could see, leave from Europe and, and fly. That's what eclipse, eclipse files do. Anyway, um, educated people can accept the eclipse. It's quite, that's a fun thing. There are people with talents that predict all this. This is from a guy called Fred S. Mackey's Mr. Eclipse. He's got a website. He can predict all these tracks and timings, and he can do it for hundreds of years into the future. But, of course, other cultures have other fears about eclipses. The Chippewa people, they shot flaming arrows into the sky to try and rekindle the sun. Tribes in Peru, they beat drums and carried on. Here's a shot. They did this actually for a lunar eclipse. They were actually... They beat... Oh, back back. They beat the dogs to make them howl at the moon or the sun to make it finish and end. And people were beating drums over here. So there's, there's a lot of superstition that been associated with eclipses down through the years. However, a safe way to, to view the eclipse is, of course, the, the man on the left there has got his eclipse glasses on. I should have brought mine on to wear them. And the other man with the beard on the right is staring at the sun without his glasses, which is probably bad for his eyes. This lady here, of course, is, is viewing the eclipse very safely. But look what she's doing. Dear, dear, dear. So anyway, <laughs> couldn't resist putting that one in. I'm viewing the eclipse and I'm having a look at it. Anyway, the poor lady's lungs. Okay. Uh, so there are safe and unsafe ways to, to view the eclipse. So the response to the eclipse often is a reflection of your level of education. You could have a PhD in astrophysics and you can, like Fred Espinac, you can predict totality to the millisecond and see where it'll be. But if there's no God in your life, then it's just another interesting phenomenon, isn't it? A rainbow's a pretty sight, beautiful sight. We can all appreciate that whether you believe in God. A pretty shell on the beach. Any number of things, you know, sparkling dewdrops on, the, pla on the, the, the brushes in the morning. So the, the eclipse is caused by the moon, and it's a bit more spectacular than, say, this is a pretty sight, isn't it? The moon, there's the earth shine on the moon. That, the, the light up here is the, the, the sunlight's hit the earth, bounce back off the earth and hitting up that part of the moon. This part of the moon is lit up by the sun. There's Venus and Jupiter in a conjunction. Uh, it's a pretty sight. Again, we're going to believe in this room. God's responsible for this. In fact, if you want to, this is 
coming up in just a couple of days, today being the 7th, on the 10th, 11th and 12th of January, just coming up, you will see, in fact, the moon will slide past Mars and Jupiter, southeast before dawn, if you're keen to get up on these cold winter mornings. Um, looks like the morning of the 11th might be the best one, but that'll be an interesting and pretty conjunction. So, okay, I'm going to steal a line from what a physicist named John Polkinghorne, he became an Anglican priest. He was convinced about the, the truth of Christianity. And John Hulking, Polkinghorne said this about music, if there's no God. He said, because you think of all the joy of music, we've sung some songs, there's, whether you like rock and roll, you know, Creedence Clearwater Revival, I, I still, I like them. Whether you like Faith of Our Fathers, there's hymns, rock music, opera music. Music's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Well, here's a cutting thing that he said. He said music. He said, I'm going to get emotional here. It's just, if there's no God, it's just an epiphenomenal froth on the surface of an unloving and uncaring universe. It just would, big deal. It's nothing. And you could say that about eclipses and all natural phenomena. It's just a wonderful thing. It lasts for two and a half minutes if you're lucky. Conjunction might last for a few hours. It's meaningless without a God. So it's fun to chase eclipses and hang out with like-minded eclipsophiles. And we're at a place called Shoshone. And there were people from Denmark, Czechoslovakia, young guy driven from Minneapolis, St. Paul. People had flown to Denver from um, Florida and then driven up from Denver. And one of the fun things was this man had driven up from Denver. We celebrated the end of Totelli with a stubby of moose drool beer. Now with a dreadful, you know it, moose's drool or moose drool beer. Uh, well, there you go. <laughs> that was a dreadful name and this slobbering moose on the, on the sticker, but, but it tasted all right. Anyway, so it's fun to chase eclipses. Now, but you, all right, not everybody's going to be into, into eclipses because they do have a cost. Now, somebody wrote a little limerick back in 2005 after a 42-second eclipse. They travelled all the way to the south of the Pacific and they actually got 36 seconds out of a possible 42. And they wrote this. The limerick sums it up. The south Pacific, it beckoned, the trip of a lifetime we reckoned. A short time in the sun was a whole lot of fun, but don't ask us how much it cost per second. <laughs> of course, it's a lot of money to fly to Tahiti and catch a cruise ship and all the rest of it. But anyway, that's what you do. So in conclusion, every day at sunset, there's another sort of eclipse. And actually, you probably haven't thought about this, but it's by the Earth. The, the Earth's rotation makes the sun set it's, we just think the sun's moving down, but it's, it's, the, it's the other way around. We're spinning around. The, the western horizon moves up to cover the sun. There's an eclipse of the sun at every sunset. Twilight begins. The sky darkens, and after a little over an hour, the stars are out in all their majestic glory of the evening stars, provided there's no fog like here at uh, Pismo Beach this morning. And they're just as glorious at 8 p.m., aren't they, as they are at 3 a.m. or midnight, but if you want to see more shooting stars, that's the meteors, then you have to go to do them in the pre-dawn hours. Now, Tony can tell you about a time in a hot tub where he's been relaxing in the evening time and saw some shooting stars. And it was probably a lot warmer than some of the shooting stars I've seen at 3 a.m. last month when it was like minus, sorry, I've got a minus 6 centigrade. It was roughly 21 Fahrenheit. It was pretty chilly. So stargazing may not be everyone's cup of tea, but nor is counting meteors. But I did get to see in another wonderful uh, celestial phenomenon, I got to see the Geminid meteor shower three weeks ago, and I got 265 in two and a half hours. I was stoked because it's not visible from Australia. It was a huge blessing to be here. The constellation was straight overhead. I was out in the dark Texas skies, and it was, it was awesome. Okay, so I've mentioned the word majestic and invisible God. Well, of course, maybe some of you are reading ahead. There's a psalm written, according to uh, looking up on the blue letter Bible it was saying 1015 BC of course King David has written Psalm 8 it's only got nine verses because I was copying the slides and I got to verse 10 and it wouldn't work and then I realized oh, it doesn't have 10 verses it's only got the nine here's what King David thought having mused upon the heavens all those years ago O Lord our Lord how excellent is your name in all the earth who has set the glory above the heavens out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now, to be honest, I usually like the King James, but to me that's a bit gobbledygookish in the King James Version. I liked it better in this version. Uh, I think it was the New Living Testament. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. I hope that's clearer for you in that translation than the King James. But verse 3 is the one we're probably familiar with. When I consider... Thy heavens, 
the work of your fingers, and the moon and stars which you have ordained. What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you're visiting him? Or in the same translation again, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? That's us, mere mortals. Human beings that you should care for them. All this majesty in the sky, deadly radiation, shooting stars that conveniently burn up 100 miles above our head and don't impact the earth. We're being looked after. You have made him, made, thou hast made him, that's man, a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. Here's the last verse. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And click again. Thanks so much, Glenn. Uh, One of the things I forgot to mention, and I meant to, is that uh, uh, Glenn and Christine are members of the GCI congregation in Sydney. And how many, how many uh, GCI congregations did you visit on this Nine trip? Nine or ten. In, in the Nine or ten? Yes. Okay. Last week, two weeks ago, we were in Vegas. <laughs> okay, yeah. And the pa our pastor there is Tim Malier. Yeah. 